Folks, we're going to get started. Uh, I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair at, at CSIS. Uh, we have a program today called 50 Years in USAID, Stories from the Front Lines. It's based on a book that's been published recently about a year ago um, that was edited by Janet Ballantyne, who's here with us today, um, t compiling stories from the history of AID, and I think I see many familiar faces in the room, and so it's really great to have all of you here. I think we've had a really a very interesting panel with uh, a significant amount of experience that they're going to share with us. And I, my view has been that we haven't gotten enough of these stories out there. And so I, I think the fact that the, uh, the turnout has been, has been good uh, for this event, I think, speaks to the fact that many people agree with me. Uh, I'm going to ask my friend and mentor, uh, the former USAID administrator, Andrew Natsios, to make some opening remarks. Andrew, please come on up. Thank you, Dan, and thanks for inviting me. I, uh, this is a remarkable book, actually, Janet. I only started, I'm embarrassed to say, I only started reading it after you gave it to me when we had our coffee last time, last month. Uh, and it is a jewel, and I, I just want to thank you for doing this. My, my uh, I have two interests up here. One is, uh, obviously, I'm devoted to AID, but I'm also now an academic running a small institute, the, the, the Scowcroft Center at the Bush School. The Bush School was started by President Bush 41, 17, 16 years ago, are now ranked in the upper 13 percent of the 265 schools of public policy in the United States. And we are moving up almost each year in the rankings. And we have a very large endowment that President Bush and other people have, have um, created. We have 300 master's degree students, and we are preparing people for federal service in the AID, the State Department, the DOD, and the CIA. So it is geared, it's a master's program, professional program. We don't have a PhD program. And I went there a year and a half ago. Don't regret it at all. We, uh, we're getting more and more competitive to get in, but we have a, uh, an institute, the Scowcroft Institute, and last September I was made director of that in addition to teaching. Now, the reason I mention that is, we have more and more money <laughs> to use. And one of the things I, I think I'd like to invest in, but I, we have to find a partner who's willing to do some of the legwork because we're, we're, we're in central Texas, 90 miles north of Dallas. We're not exactly here in Washington yet. So uh, the, the, the reason I mention this is I, I think this book needs to lead to a series of scholarly books. Each, each story told here has a parallel in much more depth, a case study that has not been recorded in the literature from an academic standpoint and from a historical standpoint. A lot of other institutions have taken credit for things that AID actually was central in creating. For example, it is widely believed for some reason the World Bank uh, is principally responsible for the miracle in South Korea and Taiwan. That is simply not true. In fact, the USAID role is only now coming out because of declassified CIA cables. Every cabinet meeting that was held, the AID mission director was in the meeting. And the mission director would actually tell President Park, you need to fire this person, they're corrupt or incompetent. And, and I didn't realize there were five or 6,000 aid workers from AID in both countries, Taiwan and, and, and uh, South Korea. Uh, they are huge success stories. The aid role now, because aid officers want local ownership, we don't want to take credit for anything. <laughs> I mean, that's self-destructive, ultimately, for AID. It may be nice from a development standpoint, but what Janet has done in this book by soliciting these stories is now, I, I didn't know half this stuff. I thought I knew a lot about AID, but the stories, there's so many stories. It's so rich a history that this needs to not be the end. It needs to be the platform that we build a whole series of additional uh, uh, books and monograms, maybe from... Uh, an academic standpoint that can be permanently in the literature so that when master's students, because we have a development program at AID, we ha I mean at AID, at uh, Bush School now with uh, several prominent economists uh, who would use this. In the, in, I'm going to put this on the re required reading list. If we can get it electronically, it would be a little easier to make my kids read it uh, for my class in development theory and practice. So the, the other thing I wanted to say is uh, some of what we do, uh, because of the nature of the federal bureaucracy, they, they want uh, 
for every dollar we invest, they want a dollar in return. This is this, this uh, law that was passed in 1993 that, that requires all federal agencies to document this. AID, if you read this and you read other stuff that's been written, is more like a, a venture capital fund, which is to say we'll invest in five things. Four of them don't work that well, maybe not permanently, but one is a sterling success. I did not know John Blackton's story here about Ariana Airlines in Afghanistan, which still exists. Uh, IFAS, uh, I, uh, you know, there, there's, uh, uh, most people don't know, IFAS was started by Peter McPherson, and Emmy Simmons really didn't start, but we were, she was the designer of this seed uh, trust that exists that we're protecting two million seed varieties for foodstuffs in the world. There's a, a large endowment behind it, and for the people who were at the beginning, I mean, she is the one that thought this through. She told me what to do, and I basically did what she told me to do. But th there, there are other stories beyond this. Now, I see my friend Lane Smith. He's not in this book, but I did not know to what degree AID introduced the Internet to Africa. I mean, literally, in a physical sense, just in, into the legal systems and all, cell phone technology into Egypt. This is, again, this is whetting the appetite of anybody interested from an academic, but also, the last point I want to make, is this is going to be lost because there's a massive change because it's going on across the federal government. In fact, it's going on in the states of senior career civil retiring and a new generation coming up. And there's this time gap because we didn't hire in the 90s. And so I, I was told that 60% of the workforce at AID now, direct hires, have less than five years' experience in the agency. Now, I was at a conference recently, and I was talking with them, and I was telling them stories about, the, they didn't even know who I was, which I, you know, I, know, you know, I am getting old, but I, I said, who, who are you? And I said, I mentioned my name, and they said, did you used to work at AID? I said, yeah, I did work at AID at one point, yes. Um, so, but they have no historic, I mean, unless they're f required to read this, <laughs> they're not going to get a sense of the enormous depth and power of the agency over the last 50 years. I think we played a much larger role in winning the Cold War than is widely understood. I have made a connection in some of the writing I'm doing between the Green Revolution, which is in here, and Dr. Borlaug told me at dinner sitting next to him when he was still alive, he, I said, well, I understand, Dr. Borla, it was the Rockefeller Foundation, the World Bank, and AID that helped you implement. He said, don't ever, I'm not going to be critical of other institutions. He said, without AID, there'd be no green revolution, Andrew. There, whenever I went there and asked for help, there was help. In fact, it was the aid administrator that, that created the term or invented the term the green revolution. The, the reason I bring it up is because the Chinese famine was going on which killed 45 million people, the latest, it's the worst famine in the history of the world, orchestrated by Mao because of this crazy economic scheme he had, the Great Leap Forward, that killed an enormous number of people. Now, what's the message? Norman Borlaug and AID are saving with, with the World Bank. He, he, he was slightly critical of the bank. <laughs> Without going to any depth, I will not use the language he used. He was yelling at me, actually, at dinner when I started saying, you know, we all shared with you. He said, no, that's not true, Andrew, and he was yelling when he said it. He said AID was there in the front lines from the beginning with us. So, and the Rockefeller Fund was certainly central to this. But what was the message in the Cold War? This was, we were, we were saving at least 300 million people's lives upwards of a billion people's lives, because famine ended in Asia as a result of the Green Revolution, except for North Korea and a, and a famine in Bangladesh in 1974. Those are the only examples. And that's because the Green Revolution didn't get to North Korea for, for, because, of the, because of the regime. So, so what's the message? Our system works. You're, you're dying in China. Okay. So now, other people want to integrate us us, the development community, into the state, the other Ds, the D, the big defense D and the diplomatic D. And the mistake of that is this. Dr. Borlaug's project took 30 years to implement. Now, I'm not being critical. I was a diplomat for a while. I have enormous respect for our ambassadors and for uh, the, the State Department. I do. I don't like the criticism made of the State Department often. Their timeline is six months, a year, two years. There's nothing in the State Department, nothing about 30-year programs or projects. The, the program to, to, to match that um, is in this book 
the uh, a university, engineering, 11, uh, 10 or 11 engineering schools with 10 or 11 uh, institutes of technology in India that we helped create. That was a 20-year project from 1951 to 1971. It actually predates AID. It's a 20-year project. Do we have 20-year project, institution building projects now? No. You know why? Because the technology, technocracy now requires us to produce quarterly measurements of outputs. If we had quarterly outcome measurements, this book wouldn't exist because we wouldn't do, been able to do half this stuff. Why? It can't be done in a year or two. The timelines are completely off. The timelines of the Defense Department and the State Department, because of the nature of their work, are not 20 or 30 years. And if you want to do this successfully, which we have proven from this book and other work that's been done, it takes a long time to do it. And sometimes at the end, if you read the evaluation, which I did at the end of 1971 on this project in India, this, uh, this linkages project between these American, one of them, the, the leading Indian IT institute was matched with MIT for 20 years. Guess where the center of the revolution in IT is in India? At that school. What's apparent now from this and then the, the democracy and governance uh, evaluation we did, a 20-year retrospective from 1985 to 2005 that um, I don't see Jerry here today, but Jerry was the one that pushed me to do it as the head of the, the office, uh, the G&G office. Um, but what it shows is that there is a time lag between the time you finish a project and the time it begins to show results. And they showed this over a 20-year period between, and this was, by the way, not AID doing the evaluation. It was done by Vanderbilt and by Carnegie Mellon. And it was done with the American Academy of Science. And what it showed in the correlations that were done, because they correlated these programs, the D&G programs, with the Democracy Index at Freedom House. And they showed a moderately robust relationship between the investment of money in these programs. And, but what they showed is a delay. It took a few years after the 10 years were up of the program, we used to run 10-year programs, uh, to have it mature. And then we noticed after there was no money being spent, the indicators kept improving. So there's a delayed reaction, which I don't think is very studied very well in the literature. I've been tr trying to find evidence of this kind of phenomenon going on in other areas. And it, it, we, know, we know from our own experience that this is the case, but it is not studied and therefore it's not recorded and it's gonna get lost. So I'm hoping what this conference will do and these stories and this book will do is launch an effort to document in much more depth with scholarly research for posterity what the role has been in the United States as part of our foreign policy, but separate and distinct from the two other Ds. Because the, to the extent that we are absorbed into the other two Ds, we cannot do this stuff successfully. Because the business systems are completely different. The more we get wrapped into the diplomatic cloak, you know what happens to the programs. They get compromised, which I'm, we all know that from our personal experience. So thank you for doing this, Dan, and thank you for doing this, Janet. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, I'm going to now uh, turn the floor over to my friend Janet Ballantyne, who is one of the editors of, of the book that you have in front of you, uh, to give us uh, a further perspective about the book and also about the, the work of AID over the last 50 years. Janet. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Andrew. I think one of the more intimidating things that one has to go through in life is being the person who follows Andrew Nazios. <laughs> uh, when in the public speak. Um, Andrew, uh, I have had the great privilege of working with Andrew very closely for several years, and I don't know of anybody who is more passionate about the work that AID does, so I really thank him for taking the time uh, from a very busy schedule to come and, and present that, that wonderful introduction. Uh, you know, looking back over my my 30-something years with AID, um, I think maybe the most interesting was when I had the opportunity of putting together this book. Um, it allowed me to, to, to look over a far wider 
uh, range of aid activities and a far larger range of years than one has the opportunity when one is in a specific place in a specific time. Um, I, for, for much of my career, I was, I was very much aware of the fact that running a program, a day-to-day -day program, you're missing a lot if you don't look to the past. Um, over the last 10 or 15 years, um, I found a, a great deal going to the oral histories, which are at the Library of Congress and also uh, at the Association for Diplomatic Training and Studies. When I was in Nepal back in that was the Neanderthal period or the Jurassic period, um, I think the, the most, the, 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 where I learned the most was going and reading Ellsworth Bunker's oral history um, about when he was in Vietnam and his wife was the ambassador to Nepal, Carol Lays. And he was running the most complex program in the world in Vietnam. But for R&R, &R, he would go to Nepal and kind of hang out in that sleepy little little kingdom where he picked up more knowledge and more understanding than many people who lived there for, for years and years. Um, putting together the book was, was really a lot of fun. You, you, those of you who got copies, um, there are about 125 stories. And I wish I could tell you these were selected by a very scientific manner. We cast our nets as wide as we could through the Alumni Association, through all the aid websites, through a lot of twist in the arms. Basically, these were the people who, who, who responded. There were maybe 150 that came in altogether, and some were simply of, of, of no general use. I would really look at this as uh, the first step. Um, Aid, the, the legislation, uh, federal government legislation, requires that most agencies have an historian. Aid is under that ceiling, and by law, there should be a, an historian sitting there. When I took on this job, I decided that I would be the historian. So I actually put a historian on my card and you know, felt like this was <laughs> another Walter Mitty uh, experience that I had. But you know, it made me, me understand that, that a, an organization like AID, because what is done in the here and now is so important for the future, really should have an historian. And I know there are others who are trying to make that case at, at higher levels than, than I have. I would love to see a volume two and a volume three and a volume four. Um, I've offered to work with any organization that would like to do that. I'd be glad to in my semi-retirement, um, be glad to put in my time. Um, having done it once, I, I might be able to do it, do it again. Um, there is at least one member of the audience who is a contributor to this book. I see other aid people who should have been, because some of this, everybody has a story, and some of the stories really have show such imagination, such dedication, and such real courage uh, in the way that the aid programs are carried out. So you're going to be hearing from three um, of the contributors, each of whom has an interesting, distinct story. But I urge all of you with your aid experience out there to be thinking about what your story would be. I would love to see that every aid person who retires has to leave behind at least a three-page description of something that he or she did during one's tenure with aid. I think this would add to what Andrew talks about, you know, a growing history uh, that begins, and I just say begins, to tell the story of the amazing change and uh, f for the good that USAID has done over its 50 some years of existence. So thank you for coming today. Some of you were able to, to snag a copy of the book. The, the book is available online from ADST, which is the Association for Diplomatic Training and Studies. ADST.org, go under the publications. You can get the book 
with postage, I think it's for $15, which is a bargain anywhere you can go. Um, so thank you all for coming, and um, I will turn it back over to Dan. Thanks very much, Jan. Jan, before we do that, can I ask you, I'm going to just have, take the privilege of being the moderator, would you just share with the audience uh, the story you told me, because I think it's very powerful, it's in line with some of the stories Andrew told about um, you were in Peru, and tell us how your connection to Alejandro Toledo, because I just think it does matter, and it's it, it, it's mm -hmm. sort of exam about the importance of the future and mm -hmm. investing for the future. How mm -hmm. how did how did Alejandro Toledo become Alejandro Toledo in Peru? How about that? Well, Alejandro Toledo's story really the the real uh, impetus be between him being Alejandro, uh, a very poor shoeshine boy in a rural area up in the mountains. And Alejandro, ex-president of Peru, starts with the Peace Corps. That this uh, young man, one of 13 children, uh, at the age of 11, became a shoeshine boy. And the, the kids in the Peace Corps, the young people in the Peace Corps, were so enchanted by this guy with a smile all the time, who used to say, oh, you're Peace Corps, I'll shine your shoes for free, that they helped him get through high school, and they got him an undergraduate fellowship to study at San Francisco State, where he graduated very high honors, came back to Peru, and was selected to go on to get his PhD at Stanford under a USAID scholarship. And I remember I'm, I was the head of the Office of Education, Health, Education, and Nutrition at the time, that the education officer brought him into my office and said, I'd like you to meet Alejandro Toledo. We're sending him off to Stanford. And here's a guy who's about the size of my son, who was about nine at the time. And uh, you know, comes obviously from a very indigenous background. The minute he opened his mouth, I mean, he was the sort of person you know that is going to make a huge difference in his country and is going to be such a, a positive force on coming to the United States. Um, he went on, got his PhD from Stanford, went on to become Vice Minister of Education, and was the first indigenous person elected to the presidency of Peru. Um, I had the opportunity of seeing him several times while he was president. He, was, he would come back and forth to the states. And I was at a symposium at Harvard one time where Lawrence Summers introduced him and talked about the wonderful things that this man had done. And the first thing Alejandro said was, I see Janet Ballantyne here. She's from USAID, and they made me who I am today. So there, and there, there are many, many people like that. But that was a real, real thrill for me. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to turn the floor over to Alex Shecko. He's the former assistant mayor senator for, for PPC at, at USAID and then had a, a distinguished career at the World Bank. Alex, over to you. Is this on? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me say in connection with what Andrew was uh, saying and what Janet followed up on, that uh, the USAID Alumni Association is trying to collect a bibliography, really, of all the writings that have been uh, done by former aid staff. I mean, there is no such collection anywhere, and that would be at least one step towards doing the kind of thing that you're talking about. So uh, if you go to our website, uh, there will be some, I think there's a reference to it on the website, but in any case, uh, if you know of uh, people in aid who've written books and articles that you think should be part of that bibliography, please let us know. Uh, it's uh, www, um, what is it, usaidalumni.org, right? So, anyway. Uh, now, uh, thank you for inviting me to participate today. Uh, my talk uh, today, unlike my colleagues here, is not a touching one of uh, human interaction in the field. It is rather a more bureaucratic tale of how we tried to develop aid policy in the 1970s. And there's some people here who know that intimately, so I have to be very careful about what I say. To set the scene, in the early 1970s, the future of foreign aid looked particularly bleak. The aid bill was even defeated in the Senate in 1972. In response to that crisis, the House International Relations Committee developed and Congress passed in 1973 the so-called New Directions legislation, 
with its focus on meeting basic human needs. Incidentally, the ideas in that legislation were importantly based on aid staffer Ted Owen's book, Development Reconsidered, which shows that there is more than one way to influence congressional policy if you happen to be an aid staff member. Uh, this legislation raised a number of challenging problems, and its implementation required great innovation by aid staff and our partner countries. PPC, under Deputy Administrator Johnny Murphy's strong guidance, led an agency-wide effort to interpret and implement the new law. Our response, and AIDS' basic approach to development, was set out in detail in our 1975 report to Congress. It is remarkable, in my view, how valid this work and its analysis remain today. Several of its key elements include, I'm quoting now, by concentrating our aid in the three key sectors of food and nutrition, population and health, and education and human resources, we seek to help developing countries increase their capacity to meet the basic needs of their people. Projects and programs are especially directed toward reaching the poor majority within the populations of these uh, nations. We urge recipient governments to design policies and programs to assure that the benefits of economic growth accrue to all the people and not just a select few. Influencing LDC institutions, policies, and systems mm -hmm are indirect but essential means of assuring that benefits reach the broadest group within the poor majority. Moreover, while it is slow going, we are emphasizing programs which involve the poor as active participants in the development process itself, avoiding any suggestion of a handout. So while, uh, ending a quote there, while elements of this focus had been present in aid programs for some time, what was new was the assertion of the agency's quote, complete commitment to concentrate our attention on these approaches and to attempt on a broad basis to engage the poor in the development process, close quote. Thus, the crucial question asked in every project and program was, who benefits? One of the most important tasks was to ensure that an emphasis on meeting basic human needs was not seen as antithetical to an interest in growth. We argued that the two must go together, growth with equity, but this was not a simple concept, still isn't, and many practical issues confronted field staff as they sought to help countries achieve both. PPC, working with our colleagues throughout the agency, developed guidance which spelled out in some detail how to help governments design a program which included an appropriate pattern of growth as a vital component of a basic human needs development strategy. Despite this, and with the benefit of hindsight, we probably still exaggerated then how much anti-poverty measures on their own would bring about sustainable growth. Another task was to set out rough benchmarks used to define the poor majority. We had to counter an extreme view that our focus should be only on the poorest of the poor, while at the same time resisting the view of others who urged a very broad definition which would not have changed anything. These examples illustrate several of the issues that arose as we tried to convince an often skeptical agency to fulfill the mandate given to us by the Congress while protecting our strong belief in a balanced approach. Some staff wished to simply carry on with the traditional big investment programs under the new directions rubric. Some staff thought it was just a passing fad. It was not easy to achieve consensus, as for many staff, this required a cultural change. As a result, we spent as much time as possible meeting with AIDS field, regional, and central bureau staff, encouraging them to raise practical operational issues in the many training sessions we organized. In the 1970s, PPC had overall responsibility for developing and recommending to the administrator the complete AID budget. In my view, this is a function that is absolutely critical if the policy bureau is to be really operationally relevant. We were the administrator's eyes and ears and sought to be an objective and unbiased arbiter in all matters, which I think we did pretty well, although no doubt the other bureaus felt differently on occasion. We also built up AIDS evaluation capacity, instituting use of the logical framework matrix the so-called log frame, which I gather again forms the underlying framework for the current focus on results-based aid. I see Bob Berg here, who was instrumental in the creation of that. These and other approaches were essential to help us analyze 
and demonstrate to Congress and others who benefits from aid-supported project projects and programs. Perhaps most critically, PPC had a strong policy group capable of addressing the broad policy issues of the agency. PPC's team of economists and other social scientists at the time was remarkable, and its support for policy-based research by outside scholars was also very influential. This analytical capacity was essential to our ability to develop and explain our approach to the New Directions legislation and a variety of other international economic and development issues. The interaction with the central bureaus <coughs> excuse me, and the regions was not always smooth as difficult questions and challenges were raised. But as a result, PPC had a strong voice in intra- and interagency discussions on a broader range of U.S. policies toward developing countries. PPC's forth, excuse me, forceful role was crucial in gaining a better balance in AIDS population, family planning, and health programs. For example, more focus on girls' education and social issues, and not simply condom delivery. Moreover, the policy group's efforts made the work of PPC's budget group much more credible. In retrospect, however, it must be said that the advent of the New Direction's basic human needs emphasis prompted a gradual erosion of AIDS sectoral and macroeconomic talent, much to the benefit of the World Bank. It is my impression that AIDS relationships with the State Department differed greatly during the Nixon, Ford, and the Carter administrations. In the former, states' views were particularly highly politicized. The Kissinger approach was to use each major speech as a vehicle for significant initiatives, which usually included AID and or PL-480 food aid. Indeed, it often seemed to us that Henry Kissinger was the PL-480 desk officer. Uh, this made PPC's efforts, along with USDA and OMB, to make the very large PL-480 Title I food aid programs more developmental, a tough job under any circumstances, even more difficult. During the Carter administration, we had a very able and development-oriented partner in Tony Lake, who as head of state's policy planning bureau was very close to Secretary Vance and Deputy Secretary Christopher. The PPC policy planning link and our contacts at senior levels uh, elsewhere in state worked very well during this period, in my judgment, and illustrated how the state aid relationship could work in close harmony and with mutual respect. Halfway through the Carter period, another complication was added to the policymaking process, the creation of IDCA, the International Development Cooperation Agency. Simply put, despite admirable intentions, it became just another layer on AIDS policymaking. Overall, I look back on that period of my PPC experience from, excuse me, 1974 to 1981 as very productive and exciting. We were able to cover an enormous number of areas because we had a top-notch staff of very bright, able, and committed people. Working with our colleagues throughout aid at a time of changing aid priorities, we made major policy decisions, many of which still seem very sensible and practical to me. There were, of course, multiple political pressures, and no doubt many more that uh, I have conveniently repressed. And, uh, but my sense is that if AID today had the kind of strong PPC that existed in the 1970s, and it, that, uh, it and uh, development in general would be much better off. While it is very disappointing to realize how much has been lost in recent years, Administrator Shaw's major effort in diff very difficult circumstances to strengthen AIDS policy capacity once again is very encouraging. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm now going to ask uh, Connie Collins, who's a former project manager at USAID, to talk about um, one of the case studies that's in the book, and, and she's going to talk about Egypt. Um, I'm very pleased to be here to uh, share my experiences with the Egypt Control of Diarrheal Disease Project. Um, in August 1981, I arrived in Cairo to serve as a health officer. Uh, the USAID mission in Cairo was very busy planning projects because they had received money from the Camp David, David Accords, and um, they were developing all types of uh, projects. Um, health was identified as one of the major problems uh, especially with children, uh, under five and infant mortality was very high. 
and it was mostly related to um, dehydration from diarrheal disease. Um, during the planning of the USAID projects, the consultants um, suggested that we consider oral rehydration salts. Prior to that time, um, dehydration was mainly treated by intravenous fluids, which were only available in hospitals and did not reach most of the population. Um, ORIS was available in Egypt at that time, but not widely used or known. And um, the intravenous fluids were very expensive and, as I say, not available to many of them, to much of the population. Um, we had contributed, USAID had contributed funding to the development of ORS in Bangladesh, and it had proved to be effective, and um, effective in treatment and also cost effective. So um, we decided we would use that as USAF, UNICEF, excuse me, UNICEF was funding um, production in Egypt. The National uh, Project for Di Control of Diarrheal Diseases was funded at $25 million, which was considered huge at that point. But the funds were fairly liberal for the Camp David Accords, so that was good. Um, the project was, uh, contract was awarded in 1982, and the chief of party was an ORS expert from the, who had worked in Bangladesh. Um, we began the the project with the uh, establishment of a secretariat in the ministry, and I was, um, I was assigned as a project officer, and we had a senior pediatrician, Egyptian pediatrician, who was the uh, project director, and he had personnel seconded from the ministry to help him. Um, in planning for the project, we, we recognized that with the high mortality, we didn't have time for doing the, the regular kinds of things that we needed to find rapid ways to reach the population and get ORS out to the children who were suffering, particularly in the hot season, as uh, this was a bad time for uh, dehydration. Egypt is interesting because 95% of the population lives on 5% of the land, and uh, this has facilitated the development of roads and railroads and the majority of the population has access to transportation to urban centers, to urban centers. In the 1970s, the World Health Organization developed a system of district health uh, centers which were accessible to the population. And the, the ministry had enough physicians to staff these centers. However, the quality of the services and um, was not good and the physicians did not like to go out to the rural areas, they wanted to stay in the urban areas. So it was difficult to keep them staffed and the system was ineffective. Um, the first task was to educate the Egyptian physicians about oral rehydration. We, as I say, Egypt is easy to get around so we were able to have regional workshops um, and the doctors came on Friday, which was a holiday, but they, they came and, and uh, took the training. They were skeptical, but they agreed that they would set up OR, um, ORS rooms in their facilities to treat the, the babies. Um, and we also trained about 5,000 pharmacists, or, I'm sorry, we trained pharmacists as there were 5,000 pharmacies in Egypt, and they mainly served as neighborhood uh, health centers and resources. Um, during these training sessions, we learned a lot about the current management of diarrhea by uh, physicians, mothers, and others. And it was recognized that many of the practices were not beneficial, such as uh, giving antibiotics and withholding food during um, diarrhea. Egyptian doctors were doubtful that the mothers, who were many of whom were illiterate, could be educated about the prevention of dehydration. But it became clear that we had to teach the mothers to use this in the homes if they were to use it effectively. Um, it also became clear that the, the Ministry of Health System did not have a good outreach system. Uh, there were very few nurses and no health educators to reach the community. Um, the, we looked at uh, what was being produced in Egypt, there were uh, leader packets of ORS, which are the standard UNICEF packets. Most of you have probably seen those in different countries. 
Um, but we had we had a lot of sociology people in, in Egypt, so we had surveys. They talked to the mothers, and the mothers said, "No, no, we don't want it. We don't have liter containers. We can't give this much, and it's not good. How about a tea glass?" So um, this led to making just 200 milliliter packets of ORS that the mothers could put in a tea glass and could be sold in the pharmacies as well as given in the clinics. In the meantime, we kept the leader packets for a larger clinics and, and uh, doctor's offices and places where um, more people were treated. Um, We also hired an Egyptian's communication expert who had received um, USAID training under the population program. And he was hired to develop mass communication programs using the available resources. He um, identified television as a possibility for de delivering ORS information. Um, Egypt was known as the Hollywood of the Middle East, and they had been producing films, Arabic language films, for many years. And this was now. Um, beginning to use for the development of TV programs. As electricity was widely available, thanks to the Aswan Dam, um, televisions were all over the country. And uh, about 70% of the, the people had access to television. If they didn't have one in their home, they had one in the, the village square where they could go and uh, watch in a public place. Um, the communication experts began, began working with uh, the TV producers to produce spots for the promote, promotion of ORS. After the first spot was produced uh, featuring a well-known Egyptian comedian, surveys were conducted to obtain reaction. The surveys found that the Egyptian physicians did not like the use of a comedian to promote ORS, and there was a neg negative reaction to the national media to the spot. The initial survey information resulted in the redesign of the message and the development of a set of commercials that used a popular Egyptian soap opera star for her, known for her good mother roles. Serial soap operas were telecast in prime time and were very popular with most Egyptians. The commercial had the star explaining the benefits of ORS as told to her by her doctor as she demonstrated how to mix and administer the ORS. She also talked about nutrition and continued breastfeeding during diarrhea, which was very beneficial. Um, the NCDDP project made the decision to fund the commercials in prime time rather than receive the free time from the government, which would have made the commercials maybe about 11 or 12 midnight. So the commercials came on at 8 o'clock, right with all the, the other, the soap opera and all the other soap commercials. And uh, so they were, they were seen by a large percentage of the population. The commercials were rapidly followed by sentinel surveys in different areas of the country to determine the level of comprehension and positive or negative reactions to the commercial. Um, this information was used to revise commercials and other messages that needed on a regular basis. The spots were effective. Within a year, the number of mothers who knew the symptoms of dehydration increased from 32% to 90%. Mm. To the secondly, they knew, those who knew about ORS increased from 1.5% to 94%. And three, those who had ever used ORS increased from 1% to 50%. By the end of the second campaign, 40% of the mothers reported using ORS for their child's last episode of diarrhea as compared to less than 20% in 1981. From 1984, clinics and hospitals were busy operating ORS room and training personnel. Um, by 1986, 16,000 physicians, 300 pharmacists, and 8,000 nurses were trained. And ORS was being sold rapidly in pharmacies, um, making keeping up with, predict with production and distribution difficult. By 1986, the MOH had recovered a large percentage of the production cost from the pharmacy sales possibly making this project the first, one of the first USAID projects to achieve cost recovery. These funds created issues as neither the Egyptian nor the US government had guidelines for managing the funds at that time. So they stayed in the bank because we didn't know what to do with them. Um, 
Tracking of morbid mortality and morbidity impact was difficult as baseline data was incomplete and underreporting was an issue in 1981. Infant mortality was 100 per 1,000 births in 1977, and under five mortality was reported as 120 per 1,000 births in 1980. Reporting forms for the NCDDP were developed and used in clinics and hospitals to track progress. Um, although there were indicators that mortality was dropping from diarrhea, other factors such as improved food supplies and general health services were also given credit. In 1988, the first USAID demographic and health survey car was carried out, and the six subsequent DH sorry, DHS surveys through 2008 found that the infant mortality dropped from 73.2 per thousand births in 1988 to 24.5 in 2008. Um, more recent has dropped this to 23 per thousand, um, I think it was 2011. Um, in 2007, uh, the Center for Global Health Development recognized the progress that Egypt had made in reducing infant and child mortality and gave credit to the Diarrheal Disease Project for much of the decrease in mortality. Um, the project not only directly impacted child health, but was a morale booster for the Egyptian Ministry of Health. And there was excellent cooperation between the MOH, USAID, UNICEF, and WHO. And this led to the development of further child survival activities that have been successful. Egyptian women also benefited from the TV messages and were able to learn good practices, good health practices, and better articulate their concerns to medical personnel and gain more confidence in medical services. In turn, the doctors gained more respect for the women in their contacts. Uh, the project helped the Ministry of Health to uh, cut costs one large Cairo pediatric hospital um, saved more than $60,000 over a three-month period, um, which was a large part of their budget in one year just by switching from ORS, uh, from intravenous solutions to ORS. Um, the use of prepackaged ORS was also a good factor, positive factor. Okay. <laughs> I'm getting the hook. <laughs> um, because while ORS can be mixed and prepared at home, it's not easy. I'm a nurse and I know it's not easy. Um, so it was, it was much easier to produce this in, in the Egyptian um, milieu and, and sell it and the mothers could easily use it. Um, so the project not only decreased the mortality, but it also <coughs> improved other factors in health. And I think that um, you know, this has been also a factor in the decrease in, in um, fertility rates in Egypt over the last 20 years, too. Sorry. <laughs> it's an incredible story. It's, yeah, it's an I know. amazing it's, story. It's and in it's, my heart. <laughs> it's, it should be. I mean, it's a, it's a thank you. Thank you very much, Connie. Thank yeah. you. Uh, I'm going to ask Owen Silkey to wrap this up, and uh, he's a former career minister at USAID. Uh, had, he retired in 1989 and then went on to have a, a second career. He's at the World Wildlife Fund. He um, has had a number of other roles as well since then. Uh, but Owen is going to tell a story from his time at AID um, regarding India. So thanks. I, thank you. Thank you, um, Nancios and uh, Alex, Connie. I, Connie and I served in Egypt together. And uh, it's kind of a, it's a privilege to be here. It's also a responsibility to rep represent the thousands of people who served with AID over, over a 50 year period. The contrast between Connie's presentation and mine is probably that Connie did very well describing where the rubber meets the road. Uh, I've been known to focus on where the rubber meets the sky. And so here we're gonna go to a story about India. Um, the story I'm gonna tell took place in 1984. And at my age, it's sometimes hard to even think back 30, 30, 30 years to these kinds of stories. But each of the stories in the book that, that Janet so carefully collected had a before and an after. They all set in some kind of a context um, before and after. And I think before I get into the, the very brief story about India, it's, it's useful to, to look at those bookends of before and after 1984. 
Uh, it can be found before in the minds of uh, Nehru and Franklin Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt, who really was the first to beard Churchill on the, on the necessity of independence for India uh, following this, the Second World War. And there's some wonderful stories. Eliot Roosevelt re recounts wonderful stories of the interactions between Roosevelt and Churchill on just that, that issue. They're really wonderful stories. It's also in, in the actions, which I'm going to refer to, of Presidents Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson. And so as we look before at what happened in 1984, there was a before. In the after, uh, there was a remarkable U.S.-India joint statement uh, issued in 2005 under the Bush ad administration, which reflected the importance of development in the bilateral relationship between uh, India and the United States, not aid, development. It also referenced, uh, as Mr. Nacios uh, mentioned, Administrator Nacios mentioned the three Ds. Actually, this, this document actually recognized the inevitable relationship between the three Ds, development, diplomacy, and, and defense. And I'm going to come back to talk about that relationship a bit in, in the story. So there's, there was a beginning, there's an end, but there's also 1984. I arrived in, in, in India in 1983, which was the height of my ambition with, uh, with, with, with AID. This is, for, for those of us of my age, if we knew anything about development before we came to aid, we knew something about uh, India. But at any rate, I'm at my desk in 1984. I receive a cable from Washington from Julia Chang Block asking me to go to the Indian government and get a thank you note uh, for the food aid that we had provided over, over 30, 30 years uh, to India. Now, I had been in India for a year, and I was wise enough to know, or not wise enough to know, that uh, th this, this was not a go. I, I was not going to go down to the Indian government and ask for a, for a thank you note. So I threw the cable in my outbox and was done with it. Of course, there was a local employee who was wiser than I who took some action, and three weeks later, I had a letter from Rajiv Gandhi who, which not only referenced uh, the, uh, uh, the, the role that, that food aid had played in, in India, but quite specifically uh, made reference to the food development and political support over a major longer period, in which contributed not only to the prosperity of the nation, but to its very existence. Extraordinary, extraordinary uh, from, from the Prime Minister. I was surprised, but at, in 1984, Rajiv had to run for uh, uh, in, in an election. And the major election campaign in both Hindi, other languages, and English newspapers was a cornucopia, a kind of uh, uh, our Thanksgiving corn cornucopia saying, do you recall the sour taste of dependency? The Congress party brought you the sweet taste of self-sufficiency. So development and, and the success with development in India was fundamentally important to the political understanding, the political commitment of uh, India's own understanding of, of itself as, as, as a nation. This importance uh, of, of, of development and, and of India was mirrored in the United States. We go back to Roosevelt bearding Churchill on the whole process of decolonization and foreshadowing uh, the formation of USAID. Harry Truman, who, who founded the Point Four program, appointed Chester Bowles, a very prominent political figure in the United States, to be ambassador to India, and actually visited in India in 1951. Eisenhower, who, who, who was responsible for the PL 480 program as, as such, and also visited India in 1959. Kennedy, of course, our book right here, USAID, the Peace Corps, and sent John Kenneth Galbraith, a very distinguished American economist, to, to be our ambassador to India. And Lyndon Johnson, who was very involved with food, food relief and actually was, the, was a supporter of what was called the short tether policy, where shipments of food aid to India were actually called down from the White House in response to development criteria, supported by John Lewis, who was on the Council of Economic Advisors and then was subsequently appointed to be the director of the program in India. So the point I'm trying to make is that development, India, was important at the highest levels of political society in both the United States and in India over, over, this, over this period. So, so in thinking a little bit about, about that, it, it occurs to me, and it's, it's something that I've been thinking about over the last few years, is development as a big idea. Development both as a, a global reflection of U.S. values and as a key factor in the growth of the local, national, regional, and global economies and the promotion of international security. Development is not simply an aid program. It's simply not a collection of projects. It's a big idea 
about the kind of world in which people actually inhabit and live. Early on in India, in the, in the late 70s and in the 80s, economic growth and investment was seen as the early key to our understanding and approach to development. And India was the focus of that analysis, as I've suggested before. And uh, for, 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 for those of you who have read in the literature in the history of development, names like Gus Rainus, Hollis Chenery, John Mellor, all these people were people who contributed to our understanding of development writ large, a good part of that written out of the experience that the United States and India shared uh, in, the de in the development years in, in, in India. And in that, that time, in those times, structural transformation, India went through the structural transformation from an agricultural and rural economy to a more sophisticated and industrial and urban e economy, and AID was fundamentally important in both of those, those measures with regard to the Green Revolution, as, as Andrew mentioned uh, er, earlier, and later with uh, investments in rail transport, iron export, hydroelectric and thermal power finance. And today, as we're out on the highways here in, in Massachusetts Avenue, we'll see the Jaguars going up and down. That's from the Tata uh, Steel Company in, in India, which was, a, which was supported by AID in these early, early years of formation. So we come to 1983. I'm just so excited, I'm going to get to go to India. Peter McPherson calls me in and he says, here's the deal, it's going to be s and It's going to be science and technology. I really uh, wasn't prepared for that. I had, I had thought about development in very different kinds of, kinds of terms, but Peter made the argument that s and could play a transformative role across a wide range of development challenges, including agriculture, education, health, climate change, poverty reduction, shelter, san sanitation. And he clearly recognized that the role of public investment was not going to be AIDS game in, in, into the future, but that policy and partnership could be a, a powerful development tool, and particularly with regard to raising productivity, which was the, the counterpart of, of, of supporting ec economic growth. So Peter, I think, recognized that we no longer had the resources for the massive kinds of investments, which actually we were able to make in, in Egypt with, with security assistance, um, but that s and soft power, if you will, could play a very powerful role in, in development. What's interesting here is that this, this, this interest mirrored Indian interest, going back to, to Nehru's initial thought about development, which was rooted in, in the importance of developing a science and technology community in, in, in India, and mirrored in the interest of the State Department, which was allocating, we had about a billion dollars in local currencies from earlier PL480 statements, which was entirely devoted to technology collaboration between the United States and, and India. We had two science counselors at, at the embassy in, in, in India, and there was a, there was a sense that uh, at a broad diplomatic kind of political level that supporting the S&T community in India was a way of securing rational thought about development politics as, as well, that the science community could contribute to a more balanced kind of political uh, re relationship. And at the same time, the Defense Department was extremely interested because India was pushing to get a supercomputer in, in, into uh, India. So we had real development interest pushed by Peter Mc, McPherson. We had substantial interest in the diplomatic side by the State Department and a serious concern uh, in, in the Defense Department. So the three Ds, if you will, were at work in, in India. And what I want to stress is that we were allowed to play our development role. We were not seen as a piggy bank for the State Department. We were seen as someone who was to contribute to the development of a sound science, a shift actually from an Indian emphasis on science to a technology community. And there we, we developed a three, three throng pro program. One was focused on Bangalore. When I arrived in, in India in 1983, there was one flight a day from, from Delhi to, uh, to uh, Bangalore. When I left four years later, there were five flights a day to Singapore. This happened very, very, very quickly. We, we supplied, uh, it's, it supported a, a range of conferences of bringing people from Silicon Valley, uh, from Route 128 around Boston, from Cambridge in, in England, to talk to uh, the Bangalore people about what, what constituted a, a technology kind of community. We made the point that it was not just science, you had to be connected to uh, entrepreneurship, to the private sector, to, to finance, and financed a collaborative program called PACT, which in the times of India when I was there called PACT is a fact, which supported collaborative R&D ventures between private sector firms, India and the United States. 
And to demonstrate that this could work, we supported the Serum Institute, which, which was the first private sector uh, producer of vaccines in, in, in India, which is today the third largest producer of vaccines in the world, and India is 65 percent of global manufacture of, of vaccines in the world. So a remarkable trans transformation. And I give enormous credit to, to Peter McPherson and his vision that science and technology could be an important driver of, of development in a big D kind of sense. So what conclusions uh, might one draw from, from, this, uh, from, from, from this experience? And I want to refer to Dan's charge to us when we came today. Uh, how does my, our story fit into the broader USA development agenda? Well, there's two points I think I'd like to make. First, that development, as distinguished from aid and its manifestation and projects, remains important to U.S. interests, however you might want to come to define that. And I think Alex this, this morning uh, tried to describe a, a little bit of how that, that definition of what we mean by development has changed over time, yet trying to maintain the relationship of basic human needs, poverty reduction, back to economic growth, productivity, and employment. I think this is the first important point that it's development that's important, and we sometimes get confused between our understanding of development with aid and with projects. Aid and projects support development, but we shouldn't lose sight of the overarching kind of agenda which, which we have. I call that big D development. And in that regard, I believe it's not only important to relate the projects and the aid that we have to this larger perception of development, however you might want to define it, but that shouldn't just be a Washington kind of rationalization. It ought to be at the center of the dialogue between AID at the country level. This was fundamentally important in India. There was a complete coincidence of, of interest between what we were trying to achieve in the aid mission and with the Indian government. They wanted access to the, to the American science and technology machine. We thought it was fundamentally important to, to, to development. And I think this is sometimes lost if, if, in today's world. Back, back then, back then, 30 years ago, we had training programs for aid directors and aid program officers on what development was, 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 was about. And it seems to me we have lost that, that conversation with governments that this constellation of projects which we have in a country has to be related to some larger understanding of how we move toward a big D development regime. So that's one kind of point, which hobby horse of mine. And the second is, is an argument that we worry less about the fact of what has been come to known as the three Ds, but rather be concerned with the content. There is inevitably a relationship between development, diplomacy, and defense and security. It seems to me this is, this is, this is reality. And so I'm not certain that the argument, some of the argument that takes place today, which fights against that reality, uh, is the right argument. The real argument ought to be, what do we mean by development? And what we mean, it, and how development is relevant to U.S. interests, not seeing USAID simply as a piggy bank for either development or, or security interests, but a structural process that takes place over time, which I think both um, Andrew and uh, Alex have, have, have stressed here uh, today. So it's a second kind of conclusion that I draw from my experience in India in 1983. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Owen. So I'm going to, I could ask uh, questions to the panel, but I want to, there's some very thoughtful people in this audience, so I'm going to do this World Bank style, which is a, uh, and I'm going to co collect a number of comments and questions, so I'd like to see some hands, and I'll, I'll call in several people, and then I'll ask the panelists to respond to the various points that we have. I know there are a lot of thoughtful people in this room, so if not, I'm going to call on you, so you can either raise your hands or you'll hear from me. So. Uh, I want to hear, if not, I want to hear, I've, I've got some people I want to hear from, but, but go ahead. Yes, yes, ma'am. First you, and then we'll, we'll, uh, please go ahead, and if you identify yourself, and we have a microphone coming to you. Hi, thank you. I'm Marilyn Merritt, and uh, I was particularly, uh, re I guess re my comment is particularly directed towards Owen's recent remarks, but I think the kinds of things that you were just pointing out, Owen, sort of display the kind of creativity that I think aid officers in the field and, and even in, you know, in PPC and places like that have to exert in sort of getting to know what a particular country is interested in and what the political will there is and what is uh, actually 
as much as we wouldn't like to admit it, what is a, in terms of appropriation on the menu of what we could negotiate about. And I think that's something that needs to be um, thought about more, too. And I think uh, some of the mentorship programs that are coming up sort of lead to that. But any comments that you might have on that? Thank you. Uh, I'm just so pleased by the effort, Janet, that you made. Uh, in 76, the de facto head of AID asked me uh, what to do with some money he had left over. And I said, well, why don't you do some oral histories on the founders of foreign aid, because that was such a unique generation in the history of the world. And he sat back and he looked at me and he said, Bob, that's the most foolish idea I've ever heard. <laughs> so <laughs> glad you persevered. I'm wondering if you were, <laughs> I'm wondering if you would uh, uh, consider a thematic second volume. And I think the theme which would be really interesting now is, would be the mature phasing from an aid relationship to a wider relationship. Because we don't seem to know as much about that history of going to binational commissions and finding mutual interests. Uh, and we seem to kind of hang on in some cases when we ought to be transferring to a higher level of relationship. And I think it, uh, histories of where we've made these transitions could be extremely helpful to current and, and coming uh, policymakers. Gentlemen, gentlemen, I just we're, comment we're, on let me just, we're gonna, oh. let me capture these and then we'll, we'll do that. Uh, I'm David Shear, and actually, uh, I retired in 84, so. Uh, but uh, t two comments. One is that the best training I've ever had for a post-aid career was AID, AID itself, in terms of both skill sets, knowledge of the context in which development goes forward, but also in which the, pro the private sector prospers. And one of the things that I have learned in the post-AID period is the link between the uh, importance of a private investment in key areas such as in Eastern Europe and development. And then the transfer of that technology in non-governmental ways through the private sector to other private sectors or, and to the government itself has had huge impacts in places like Hungary and in Poland and have brought about transformation uh, in, in those places. So those links uh, in terms of the application of what we have learned as uh, in the, the, the College of Aid experience in the, the later parts of our life uh, have had, I think, significant influence and can ha and be transformative, both in the area of uh, public employment as well as public investment. Great. Okay. Let's take those three. And Owen, why don't you go first? Comments. One, one was uh, on Bob's on on the ev evolution from a quote aid relationship to some broader development diplomatic political mature relationship among, among nations. And I, I do have a copy here, but I think the 2005 agreement between India and the United States is, is, a, is a wonderful re reflection of that. It was not caught up with uh, some of the institutional mechanisms that we've, that we've used in the past, moving to commissions, to, et cetera, but to a broad political understanding between the two governments as, as to what was important to them. And the role of development played a really important role in, in that statement. So I think that's really it was a 2005 uh, joint 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 statement. The second is Dave's point on on the private sector, and and I couldn't ag agree more. But it seems to me that AID can get caught in supporting the private sector in, in many of the same ways as it can get caught in supporting trying to support diplomatic and defense kind of kind of initiatives. If it's not related to a clear understanding of how those investments relate to development in an important kind of kind of way, um, AID can end up being uh, an agent of the Commerce Department rather than an agent of, of development. And so it seems to me, again, it's that relationship to a broader understanding and commitment always of testing of how do these investments re relate to a broader understanding and agreed agreement with a country on how that advances the, the processes of development. I guess what I want to say is every private sector investment isn't a good one in terms of development, yeah. as we're seeing in large parts of Africa, it seems to me. Connie, could I ask, I'm just going to go down this way from, the, from, from Owen, if you could just, if you wanted to respond to any of the comments that you heard. I don't have anything okay. okay, okay. Alex. 
I don't think I'm being okay. Mm. Janet? Well, let me respond to Bob Berg's challenge that we broaden the scope of uh, any follow on volume. Um, I think we're looking for somebody else to do that, that uh, somebody with a, a, a lot more time, because um, this is not going to be a six month project. I guess my concern is everybody wants to write a history of aid. And there have been a number of histories of aid, and none of them have really done it because it's just too big. Andrew is doing a history of aid now, but I think that will probably be focused, a little more focused than some of the ones that have come in the past. This was, a, just to just take one slice, a slice of the people. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk to my friends at the Alumni Association and ask, you know, why don't we send out something to the Alumni Association and say, well, can, you know, will people submit their stories? And we'll do a volume two or a volume three or whatever it is. Um, because this is sort of within the manageable interests of somebody like me who doesn't like getting up at 7 o'clock in the morning like I used to do. <laughs> That's the lovely thing about retirement. Um, but I know who to come to, Bob, when we start that project. <laughs> and, and I want to associate myself with Bob's comments about the about middle income, how, how countries transition. We did a report here a couple of years ago looking at five cases where US, U.S. government had changed its relationship with a country, South Korea, Portugal, it's called Strategic Foreign Assistance Transitions, and I commend that to you. I don't think it captures all of um, the point that Bob is making, but it, it gets a, a piece of it, and so I appreciate you, Bob, raising it, because I agree with you that I think this is something that needs f further uh, review and study, so thank you for flagging that. I just want to take advantage of, Andrews, you're, you're, you're here in the audience. Do you want to just reflect on what you, what you heard on the panel since we, we have you here, and I know you're never short of opinions? Well, one of the prom it's, it's a problem, uh, excuse me, it's a problem, it's also uh, easier to explain. One of the changes the uh, Nixon administration made, in fact, they made a number of changes that were beneficial to aid, one of which was to um, concentrate all spending in AID through other federal agencies. So there was an executive order that apparently came out when Nixon was president saying you cannot spend any, uh, domestic agencies can't spend money in foreign aid abroad unless it goes through aid, and aid would control the money, uh, which I think is a much better way than these coordinator positions we've had through the State Department where the people who are career diplomats who do this don't really understand the developmental issues and cannot resolve some of the conflicts between federal departments on these issues. But uh, the, the, the sector-based approach is easier to explain, which is when the other initiative of Nixon was to change from uh, the budget being in technical assistance, training, infrastructure, rather than in sectors, uh, uh, which is what we have now. That was the change Nixon made. The problem is it doesn't capture this central issue, in, in my view, and that is how does aid sustain these changes. And you only, the only way to sustain these changes is through institution building. It doesn't have to be through the government necessarily. It can be through the nonprofit sector, and it can be through um, uh, the, the private sector. The question is, what have we learned about successful institution building? When I was doing my interviews for this book, the book is not a history of aid. It's a, a look at some of the clashes, actually, uh, between aid and uh, state and DOD over the years, uh, when that happens, and when there is a synergy that actually works, because you've described how it can be successful, and it has been. But, but there's also a lot of tension between the three Ds that is not being properly described in the conversations in Washington right now. They act as though these three things are always in unison with each other, and uh, that's just not true. It's just, I, I'm, from my own experience in 10 years in aid, it's, simp it's nonsense. There are fundamental issues that divide the three Ds from each other. It doesn't mean you can't work something out. But this is the question. When I did my interviews at the World Bank, they said, uh, and the World Bank is a repository now of much of the best research on aid. I'm not sure their programs are as good as our programs, but in terms of research and data, they are a huge uh, storehouse of information. And the comment made, which was extraordinary, is 
there is a vast literature on the centrality of institutions in development. No institutions, no development. Whether it, you take Douglas North's view of that or, or you take a more institutionally, uh, organizationally based, either definition. There's almost no literature. They all said this, and the, some people in aid said this, and, and in the academic community. There's almost no literature on how to do it. Okay? We actually have, through this book and through my own research, examples of us having created institutions 50 years ago. Now, you know, a lot of the people in the institute don't even know we had anything to do with it. Okay? The question is, what are the factors, what are the, the, the programmatic mechanisms that lead to sustainable institutions that can keep the whatever change you've made permanent so that it's sustainable over the long term. How do you do it? And there is very little literature on that. And I think if we, instead of doing a sector-based approach, which is one way, I don't disagree with what Bob's saying is, but I'm saying one other thing we could do is to look at uh, the toolbox that we use, because I don't actually think we're doing, we're designing programs now using all the tools necessary to create sustainable institutions. We use some sometimes, we don't see how they relate to each other. And there's no there's no general theory of how to do this, and we need it, because that's the only way, ultimately, that what we do is going to be sustainable over the long term. Janet, I'm going to give you the last word. Well, Dan, thank you very much, and thanks CSIS for letting us see your wonderful new uh, digs here. Um, CSIS has always maintained a very active interest in the development community, and all of us appreciate this very much. And thank you for coming out. Uh, it's such a lovely day. I mean, I was really thinking of just sitting out in the backyard until somebody pointed out it was 28 degrees. But having sunlight makes such a huge difference. But thank all of you. And um, one question that, that came up before was, why isn't this book online? Um, Marilyn Merritt and her husband have been pushing this for some time. We are looking at a way of putting this online so Andrew's students and uh, uh, colleagues at, uh, in Texas can look at it and other universities. I'm involved with some university work now. It is a question of finding, the, getting the people with the copyright and the people with the know-how together and uh, we're still working on that. But thank you all for coming out and uh, and thank you for maintaining your interest and your input into um, the development process.